Welcome to the webinar. I'm Paul Hallett, President-Elect of the British Society of Soil Science, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our third webinar of the year. Today's event is supported by the Soil Science Society of Ireland. And before I welcome our panelists, I'd like to introduce the British Society of Soil Science as hosts of today's webinar. We're an established international membership organization and charity committed to the study of soil in its widest aspects. We bring together those working within academia and have a growing membership amongst practitioners implementing soil science and industry and those with a keen interest in soils. We'll be hosting nine webinars during um, 2023, so please do keep an eye out on our website for further details. As mentioned, today's event has been organized in collaboration with the Soil Science Society of Ireland, and I'd like to welcome Sarsa Tracy to give a brief introduction to the organization. Thank you for joining us today. Sorsa, over to you. Thanks, Paul. Hello, everyone. My name is Saoirse Tracy and I'm an assistant professor in the UCD School of Agriculture and Food Science and it's my honour to be able to support the seminar today on behalf of the Soil Science Society of Ireland. So I'm the, the chair of the Soil Science Society of Ireland which has been established since the late 1960s. The membership activities and scope of the society encompass the island of Ireland and as a society we actively promote research, knowledge, transfer and sustainable management of soils in Ireland through scientific meetings, field meetings and other outreach events. We particularly like events that bring together artists, soil scientists and many different stakeholders. We recently hosted an, an early career event at the Global Soil Biodiversity Conference, conference which, which, which was held at University College Dublin on the 13th to the 15th of March this year. So, potentially some of the attendees were at that conference as well. So welcome to the webinar. And our current plans at the moment, we are organizing the with the British Society of Soil Science, the annual general conference, and it'll be in Belfast on the 4th of the 5th of December. And then the early career event will be held two days after on the 6th and the 7th of December. So we hope to see you all there. We are planning to extend the abstract deadline so that we'll be accepting ab abstracts until the end of the month. So if anyone's worried about the deadline for tomorrow, look out for your emails because it will be extended. Um, so thanks, I hope you enjoy the uh, webinar and I'll hand you back to Paul now. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Sarsa. We're really looking forward to that conference. Um, before we begin, just some basic housekeeping. Since there's so many of you here today, microphones have all been muted. We'll be taking questions at the end of both presentations and Sursa will monitor these for us. Please could you submit any questions you have by 12.50 to allow us to get through as many as we can. There is a raise hand button, but again, we have a big number of um, attendees on this, so we're not gonna use that um, today. We'll just use the text questions. And today's presentations um, have also been awarded bases and NROSO CPD points. So if you're registered with either body, please contact us directly after the event. And finally, please be aware that today's recording or today's presentations are being recorded. Okay, so now over to our speakers. I'd first like to introduce um, our uh, first presenter, Professor Matthias Rillig. So Matthias is a professor of plant ecology at the Free University of Berlin, and he's also director of the Berlin Brandenburg Institute of Advanced Biodiversity Research. He has a PhD in ecology from the University of California, Davis, San Diego State University, and he's written and contributed to a huge body of uh, research in the field, including on microplastics. So Matthias manages the Rillig Lab at the Free University of Berlin, and it mentors and supports students and researchers of plant, fungal, and soil ecology. They carry out projects around global change, biodiversity, and the functions and ecology of soil fungi. So over to you, Matthias. Yeah, thanks very much, Paul, for the nice introduction and to the British and Irish Soil Science Societies for the invitation to speak to you today. So in my 20 minutes, what I want to do is give you sort of a conceptual overview of microplastic effects in soil. Uh, this is not gonna be like um, 
a dog and pony show for data, but I'd rather share with you the things that I find most exciting about this topic from a more conceptual perspective. So I hope you will find that useful. And I hope that you will find some of those conceptual points, also entry points for you to get excited about this topic. So I like to start my presentations with this slide, which is from 1955, when you know plastics became more widely available to people in their everyday lives, and people were sort of overjoyed, as you can see in the happy faces in this magazine photograph, because their lives were made so much easier by the availability of all these disposable plastic items that you could just use once, throw away, and don't worry about washing up or anything else. But of course, as we now know, in hindsight, um, there is a huge cost because there was actually a lot of this plastic produced over time. And a lot of this plastic has become, as is euphemistically called, environmentally available, which means it is somewhere out there in the oceans or, in, or on the soil. And the overall amount of plastic waste ever produced is estimated to be 6,300 million tons. So it's quite a enormous amount of this material that has been produced. Now, research on plastic is um, actually not as new. It has a relatively long history in the ocean environments where plastic particles were found uh, in the oceans already in the 70s and also where the term microplastic was first coined. And research in the soil environment started only several decades later, probably because you simply can't see it. <laughs> um, I mean, if I give you a soil and I tell you there's so much microplastic in that soil, you will still not be able to see it because it just gets incorporated into the structure of the soil. And it's not as immediately obvious as in a water column. So when we talk about microplastic here, what we mean are plastic particles smaller than five millimeters and usually one dimension. And um, this is the definition that's generally being used nowadays. Um, and so the first thing that I want to tell you is that microplastic does arrive at the soil surface via a huge variety of different means and pathways. And afterwards, it becomes integrated into the soil. So there are really a lot of different input pathways, and they vary in relative importance depending on where you are. Um, no matter where you are, you're going to be experiencing aerial deposition of microplastic, mostly in the form of uh, fibers, like from clothing, because it's so light and gets easily um, trained the atmosphere. Um, but there's also a source of microplastic from discarded plastic litter that then fragments over time. It doesn't decompose, but it just breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces over time. Um, there's also a lot of uses in an agricultural context that actively bring um, plastic into the environment. Think of plastic mulching, but also many other agricultural products, including some fertilizers that actually uh, are encapsulated in microplastic or other features in an agricultural context. There's addition of compost and sewage sludge where um, that contains actually a lot of plastic and cannot be effectively removed during the processing. And then of course, there is tire abrasion for, um, from roads, which is probably the numerically most important source of microplastic in many places on the earth. So there's a variety of ways how microplastic arrives at the surface. And once it is, has arrived at the surface, it can then very effectively become incorporated into the soil. For example, by the action of animals. This was some of the first work that we did in our lab, like earthworms or microarthropods. They can just kick the stuff around or uh, drag it down in their tunnel. So it gets very quickly incorporated into the soil matrix. But of course, there's other means by which this material can get integrated, for example, to plowing, harvesting, via root channels, movement with water, and so on and so forth. So basically, what is very clear is wherever you are, your, your soil will contain microplastic even the most remote areas on this planet will be exposed to microplastic. And once it's arrived at the soil surface, it will then also be effectively incorporated into the body of the soil, which means we can then or need to worry about what it will do there. And maybe one of the more interesting things in this talk for you is that you can basically think of microplastic research or in terms of thinking about microplastic effects in soil, 
from two different vantage points. This has actually been sort of, um, a, this, this, this slide describes a journey for us in our lab uh, over a couple of years where we were sort of um, wondering what is this microplastic actually. And so the most obvious vantage point from which to view microplastic research and also the context in which most of this work is going on still nowadays is ecotoxicology because you know clearly this is an anthropogenic material and it is in the environment it can have um, adverse effects on processes and biodiversity and individual species so of course it is um, part of the realm of ecotoxicology where then the focus is on current contamination levels, the focus is on negative effects that typically employ highly controlled experiments and the readouts are usually from accepted individual model organisms. But how we mostly view microplastic in our lab is we view it as a factor of global change. And that vantage point, it's just a subtle change in the way you view things has a lot of important consequences because for one, your focus becomes on future contamination levels, maybe in another 50 years, similar to what we do work on, let's say, elevated atmospheric CO2. Also, any effects are of interest and relevant because also many factors of global change have nominally positive effects, for example, on plants such as elevated atmospheric CO2, warming or nitrogen deposition. And the focus moves from these highly controlled experiments to more higher ecological relevance and an ecosystem relevance and more ecosystem relevant endpoints. And also because it gets incorporated into the set of global change factors, what immediately becomes relevant is interactions with these other factors of global change, such as climate change, invasive species and many other facets. So this is an important um, shift in vantage point, or you can choose from which perspective you want to view this problem. And it has real consequences on how you design your experiment and how you interpret the results. Right, so the next point I want to talk about is microplastic is not just one thing. Microplastic is actually a ton of different things. It really is a contaminant suite. And I'm only going to highlight some things here. So initially, we started our work with, as most people, because you can order it from a catalog, with little beads of plastic. And um, when you do that, you observe completely different effects than when you use fibers, which is shown in this particular example here from an experiment where we added fibers uh, and looked at the effects on soil aggregation. And you can see the fibers also get incorporated into the soil aggregates and therefore have effects on the stability of these aggregates, as you might imagine, mostly those effects are going to be negative effects, at least in our sandy soils here. So what that led us to uh, ponder, basically, is that this is a very specific and unusual situation for an environmental pollutant, most of which are synthetic organic chemicals, so also heavy metals that are basically compounds, you know, like PFAS or whatever have you. But here, you're really dealing with particles. That is fairly unique among um, synthetic organic chemical pollutants out there. And because you're dealing with particles, these things can also have a shape. And the shape can actually be quite important in determining the effects. And we've shown that repeatedly in very many experiments done in our lab, on a wide range of um, plant species and also soil parameters, that the shape of this material really seems to matter a lot. That gave rise to the shape dissimilarity hypothesis that basically says maybe the more dissimilar the shape of the plastic material is to the naturally occurring shape population of particles in the soil, maybe the more severe are the effects. It seems to generally bear out that all other things more or less equal, <laughs> the fibers seem to have um, stronger effects than, for example, say fragments, which more resemble other soil particles. And also films um, fall into that category because they're also quite different from the naturally occurring population of shapes. Uh, but of course, there's many other aspects to this. For example, 
how these particles in the environment age or degrade. This is work uh, done together with Walter Waldmann. Hello, if you're listening, Walter from Brazil. Um, so there's um, different um, effects, actually quite a lot of different effects when these materials have been environmentally degraded versus when they are sort of pristine plastic materials. And of course, the list goes on and on. These things have different polymers. And most importantly, these things also have different additives. And all of this taken together, they all multiply up, means this is a, <laughs> a problem of quite huge complexity in terms of the types of materials that you need to consider when you do this work. Now, also another important feature of microplastics as particles is that they have an interior volume. Now, having an interior volume seems like a, a trivial point because you have a particle, but it is actually sometimes quite important in understanding effects. This is work that Shin Ung Kim in my lab has done, a um, really nice experiment where he um, added microplastic particles to a bit of soil and examined its toxicity on nematodes, soil nematodes. And so what he did is he basically washed with various solvents, but also water was just enough microplastic particles. And then he added the washed microplastic particles back into the soil with the uh, C. elegans. And the toxicity was gone. The toxicity was only due, due, to, due to the extractable additives, the compounds that leached out of these particles. Now, but the really interesting part of this experiment was when he left then the freshly extracted microplastic particles sit around in soil for two weeks and then added those back into the assay, those particles were toxic again. Why is that? Because in the meantime, more and more of these chemicals that are contained within the body, the solid interior of these um, microplastic particles could diffuse to the outside of the surface and be released again. And there's also nothing like this that could happen with a single substance. Huh? So the particle itself basically is a time release um, agent where uh, these um, other chemicals can be released over time. That has led us to formulate um, this hypothesis of a global plastic toxicity debt, where we basically have incurred already a debt by the release of all these plastic materials in the environment that are slowly degrading. By degrading, they attain a much greater surface area, which makes this diffusion to the surface within the body more effective. And so these materials can be more easily released over time. And so maybe the toxicity peak is still to come and is somewhat in the future. Somewhat disturbing thought, but um, you know, this could be real because these things really are bodies with an interior surface. And then um, the last thing that I want to really talk to you about is uh, more this global change focus with um, a perspective to examining microplastic within the context of earth system feedbacks. And that has been basically brought about by considerations of how plants can be affected by different microplastics. There are different routes depicted here via which microplastic can affect plants. Um, one of the more predominant routes for, for example, fibers, microplastic fibers, is the effect on soil structure and soil bulk density and water holding capacity. Um, when you add fibers to a soil, the soil becomes basically fluffier. The bulk density goes down, the water holding capacity goes up, and there is probably less resistance to the roots to grow in the substrate. So plant growth is often, but not always, but often enhanced. This is one way um, how plant growth can be affected. Of course, there can also be direct toxic effects, for example, when this material further degrades into nanoplastic, but also when it is material that with an inherent toxicity, like say tire wear particles will always have negative effects on plant growth, at least when we tested it. But since plants can be affected, and since the very fabric of soil can be affected by these particles, if you put those two together, it becomes very likely that there are important effects manifesting at the ecosystem scale that could be important for feedbacks with the Earth system. As, and another uh, brick, a piece of the puzzle is that microplastics we have shown really affecting ecosystem multifunctionality. 
So it can change a whole range of different ecosystem processes simultaneously, for example, also enzymatic activities. And there can be a shift in plant community composition because microplastic, for example, will provide in unequal benefits to different members of a given plant community. We did this in this little model plant communities consisting of six to eight species. And I've subsequently also repeated this with uh, up to 16 species. And so basically there can be these shifts at um, various levels of the ecological hierarchy that could be very important for understanding what goes on at the ecosystem scale. And this is basically summarized here where microplastic will increase over time in the soil because it is a persistent material that is not readily degraded. It can really change um, soil aggregation, soil structure, change microsites, therefore also change very important fluxes of greenhouse gases, such as the balance between CO2 and methane, which um, we and others have shown. It can affect, as we just mentioned, the performance of plants and therefore potentially CO2 drawdown if this happens at a broad scale. And there are very many other process rates that could also be affected that have also got relevance for um, the behavior of the system uh, of, of microplastic in an ecosystem. <clears throat> so I just want to give you quick take home messages. Microplastics is also a new global change factor, not just an ecotoxicology problem and their effects on soil properties, plant performance, community composition of plants, and also of microbes. And there can be a range of ecosystem processes affected. The second take home message is that we're still discovering effects of microplastic in soils and ecosystems, and there are many unknowns, and they're very important unknowns, such as we don't know very much about long-term effects because experiments have usually been relatively short-term. We don't know about the diversity of microplastic types, also what happens when they occur together. And that includes many, many dimensions of diversity, including weathering. And we have very limited evidence, even though we work a lot on that currently with other, on the interaction with other factors and context dependence. In terms of context dependence, um, one PhD student in the lab here, Ting Ting, has done an experiment where she added exactly the same microplastic uh, to 150 different soils throughout Germany. And <laughs> she finds extreme negative effects a lot of neutral effect and also very, very positive effects of exactly the same microplastic, even within uh, the confines of a country like Germany, let's say. Um, and this is basically the point I wanna highlight. Microplastic is just one facet of global change. It is interconnected with many other effects. For example, also the um, what happened during the pandemic <laughs> is all interconnected with other factors of global change. And thus, it, it makes a lot of sense to think of microplastic in the context of these other global change factors. We are currently examining this in a whole lot of experiments in the lab, but we are also, we're also examining this in the field in a global change experiment that's set up about 10 minutes walk from where I stand now, where we're looking at interactions with up to 10 factors of global change, one of which is microplastic. Now, I think this is very important to understand what the real effects are because microplastic is not going to have effects just in isolation, but in concert with other factors. And with that, I'm out of my 20 minutes. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Matthias, for that very thorough and thought provoking talk. We'll now, or so we'll be taking questions for both speakers at the end of the session. Our next speaker is Dr. Taro Sandean. So Taro is a senior expert in the Department for Soil Health and Plant Nutrition at the Austrian Agency for Health and Food Safety. Taro is also one of the founding members of the Teabag Index, which is a method to measure decomposition in soils with the help of commercial tea bags. She received her doctoral degree in geography from the University of Iceland, in which she focused on soil aggregates and soil organic matter in European agricultural soils. So over to you, Tara. Thank you very much, Paul. Just a moment, I will share my screen. Okay, <clears throat> can you see my screen? Great. Uh, very good afternoon from my side as well. Uh, very nice to uh, be here. 
Uh, I would like to take you further uh, how to do plastic observations uh, with the help of the, the Soil Plastic uh, app that we've been uh, developing in the framework of the Minacris uh, project. To take you a little bit back to, to how much uh, plastic is out there, uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, how much plastic is demanded in the society. In 2021, uh, the European uh, plastic converters uh, were demanding 50.3 million tons of plastic. That's quite a big number of, uh, of plastic. And this was the, the, the first time after two years of decrease uh, that the demand was increasing again. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, you see countries uh, where more than uh, 3 million tons uh, were demanded. Uh, and while you walk, uh, walk the line towards the right, uh, there is less and less uh, demand. Uh, but you see uh, the big demand countries on the left, like Germany, Italy, France. When moving further uh, and thinking uh, who is demanding all of this plastic, on this slide uh, you see uh, the different sectors uh, that are demanding uh, plastic. Uh, so packaging, of course, uh, being uh, the biggest one with about uh, 40%. Uh, but if you look into agriculture, farming and gardening, uh, that's also quite a considerable amount that is uh, demanded there, about uh, 1.6 uh, million tonnes. Uh, and in the Minacris project, uh, we are focusing on agricultural soils. Uh, that's why I'm highlighting agriculture, farming and gardening here. When then thinking how do plastic get into agricultural soils, and how does it get into the surrounding environment from there? Uh, in agriculture, there is uh, quite a number of uh, direct and indirect uh, sources of plastic. Uh, the direct sources are such as mulch foils, plant protection nets, uh, twines, uh, silage nets. Uh, there is also a lot of vegetables that are covered by plastic in the beginning of the season or different parts of the season, and all these uh, is plastic that can then also be broken down into smaller pieces, just like Matthias was explaining earlier. Uh, there is also quite a number of uh, indirect uh, sources uh, such as compost, uh, sewage sludge, manure. Uh, there might also be uh, uh, plastic coming from irrigation or from fertilizers. Uh, and all of this plastic uh, can then, of course, be uh, transported uh, in the environment. Uh, there is a lot of plastic that can uh, move away uh, with the runoff uh, or water erosion, uh, and thereby it can move to the surrounding uh, uh, water environment, but it can also move within uh, the soil profile. Uh, however, uh, we still don't know enough of these uh, transport uh, pathways uh, and how fast uh, they go and how this is uh, connected to, to the climate, for example. Uh, the Minagris project is a Horizon 2020 uh, project uh, that is focusing on micro and nanoplastics uh, on agricultural soils. Uh, it investigates the sources, environmental failed and impacts on ecosystem services and overall sustainability. It's a five-year project uh, coordinated by uh, Wageningen University uh, with about 20 partners, uh, of which uh, Argus is uh, one of. The, the project is, um, <clears throat> first of all, starting to, to have a look uh, uh, what kind of plastic is being used, uh, what kind of intentional, unintentional sources there are, uh, and then moving into what kind of impacts uh, this has on soil functions, on ecosystem services. Uh, and the, uh, the work is then done in uh, a number of case studies. Uh, we have uh, 11 case studies uh, across uh, Europe from north to south, uh, west to, to east. Uh, and in these uh, case studies, uh, we uh, go out and work together with the farmers. In each one of the case study, we have about uh, 10 farmers uh, who have welcomed uh, the research teams uh, to take uh, soil samples uh, so that we can see uh, how much micro and nanoplastic is out there. Uh, what kind of a problem is it in real agricultural fields? 
you also see that there are uh, dots with two colors, with both orange and uh, yellow. And these are the partners who also have uh, experimental uh, field stations. So there, there are more in detail uh, investigations of uh, microplastic. Uh, but in all of the 11 case studies, we've taken uh, soil samples uh, in order to see uh, how much micro and nanoplastic is out there. Uh, in Austria, we have uh, two case studies. Uh, the first uh, case study is in the Marfeld. This is the area uh, between Vienna and uh, Bratislava, the so-called uh, breadbasket of, uh, of Austria, where a lot of intensive agriculture is taking place. Uh, the area is very famous for its uh, aspargers, uh, and those fields are, of course, also covered with plastic um, around this time of the year. We are getting to the prime season of aspargers. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of other vegetables uh, grown, uh, and from there we have 10 farmers who are cooperating. Uh, our other case study is in the Alpine foothills, uh, where we also have uh, uh, farmers growing vegetables uh, and different kinds of cereals. Uh, and there we also have a long-term experiment uh, where compost application has been taken place since the early 90s uh, with uh, four different kinds of composts. Uh, and in the Austrian case studies, like in the uh, other uh, case studies across Europe, soil sampling was taking place uh, last year in the spring. And at the moment, we are waiting for the, the results. So the samples are, are being uh, analyzed. And uh, towards uh, the summer, we are hoping to know how much uh, micro and nanoplastic was found on the fields. Uh, we've also been doing several surveys uh, with the farmers. Uh, so far, four surveys have been done in order to know uh, what kind of plastic is used by the farmers, uh, what kind of crops are grown on the farms uh, and on the particular fields uh, that we are sampling. Uh, we also want to know about the management of, of those farms uh, in order to get a good overview uh, of plastic use on the farms and also have enough background information to explain the results of micro and nanoplastic in the soils that we are seeing. Um, a little insight into what we have uh, uh, got from the, the farmers uh, so far. Uh, so here you see how the farmers themselves are estimating the amount of plastic on their fields. You see there is quite a number of farmers who are stating uh, that the, the plastic on the fields is about uh, medium, but we also have quite a number of farmers who feel that the amount is quite high or that the amount is uh, uh, small. So there is quite a, a variety of uh, opinions among the farmers that are participating with us. Uh, something that is quite uh, interesting and surprising is that nearly 70% of the interviewed farmers had no knowledge of initiatives that are working on plastic reduction uh, or plastic removal from fields and landscapes. Uh, and this is kind of, um, yeah, very, very surprising, I would say, uh, because across Europe there is uh, quite a number of uh, initiatives, uh, national initiatives as well as European initiatives, uh, to discuss about uh, alternatives uh, to plastic. What kind of biodegradable options are out there? How could they be used? Uh, what would it mean for a farmer to actually switch? What kind of a monetary cost would that have? Uh, and there are also quite a number of initiatives uh, removing plastic uh, from the landscape. Um, as we are speaking, spring is really the high, high time of uh, actions uh, out there, people collecting uh, plastic. So there is some kind of a mismatch of getting this information into the farmers as well. When looking into what kind of plastic sources there are in the fields that we are investigating or in the, the general case studies that we are investigating, in here you see the, the responses uh, to question what types of plastic have you used on the farm over the past 10 years. Uh, you see that the mulch and other foils uh, are on the top of the, the answers. So this is something that is very regularly in use for a number of uh, reasons. There is also irrigation equipment that is made out of uh, plastic. Uh, there is harvest uh, and transport boxes, uh, transplant trays and pots, uh, of which some are, are single use, 
There are a lot of ropes and clips uh, that are made of uh, plastic. Uh, they can be insect traps, plant protection products, all kind of labels and nets. And all of this can end up in the soil and become smaller and smaller pieces where it's even then harder to collect it back. And in order to get a bit bigger overview on the, the European level, but uh, why not on a more global level as well, uh, we in the project uh, have uh, <clears throat> developed a so-called soil plastic app uh, with which uh, you can do observations of uh, visible plastic on soils. Uh, the app is uh, focusing on agricultural soils. We are hoping to get more information on agricultural soils. However, please feel free to use it in a park or in a forest if you see plastic uh, around. Uh, the app is available uh, for Android, Apple, uh, as well as a browser version, and it's uh, for free, so everybody can download it. And what you can uh, do with it uh, is, of course, to, to make uh, spots, so to add information of uh, plastic that you see in the environment. Um, and we have a number of minimum info that we would like to get. So first of all, we would like to know in which kind of land use you are. Uh, we follow the Copernicus uh, uh, land use categories, uh, so you can easily click where you are. Uh, we would like to know the amount of plastic that you see, uh, the size of the plastic, as well as a photo of the plastic, because thereby we can also go to the results and, and kind of validate and see does this uh, entry make sense. Uh, we can also get a little bit uh, extra information uh, on the plastic. So uh, if the user wants to spend a little bit more time, they can also add the color of the plastic, uh, the type of the plastic. So you will get a long list of different kind of agricultural plastics or just simply uh, packaging. And we would be very, very grateful for that information. Uh, it's also possible uh, to add uh, other disposed uh, material. So if you see metal, if you see glass, uh, that can also be there. Uh, and we also would like to know uh, how does this make you feel? Does it make you sad? Does it make you happy? We would be very happy to know that. Um, uh, another fact that we would uh, encourage the users to do is to um, dig a little bit deeper into the soil. So tell us a little bit about the soil um, around the, the spot uh, where they are doing their observations. And this can, for example, be done by the texture by feel method. So you can give us uh, information whether you have sand, silt or clay. Uh, and you, you can also observe uh, soil organisms. So we have a, a list of uh, soil organisms uh, that you can observe. You can simply click there. If someone doesn't know uh, what all these organisms are, there is also an information that you can click so you get a little bit uh, further information on those. <clears throat> when the, the observation is there, uh, you can uh, see your observation on an interactive map that you see on the, the left there. So you simply see all the, the observations that the various citizens uh, have been uh, doing. You can click on a particular spot, like uh, you see on the, the middle. Uh, you can see, for example, what are the, the newest uh, spots. And you can click on an individual spot and, for example, uh, click on a heart. Uh, and that gives an indication to another user that you appreciate the contribution of another user. You appreciate that someone has been observing uh, plastic or you appreciate that the person has actually collected the, the plastic away from the environment. Uh, you can also see uh, some statistics. So uh, uh, how much uh, data has been coming up, uh, in during the, the last week, the last month, uh, the last year uh, or in total. Uh, and uh, you can uh, also directly uh, comment uh, to uh, another user. So you can uh, give a, a comment on the, uh, the entry that someone else uh, has been uh, doing and uh, thereby you can also 
start discussing with one another. This can be very nice uh, to do with a person who is maybe in the same area where you are or with a person who is in a country where you are on a holiday, for example. All depending on what the user wants. And this is a, a map of our case studies uh, once more to show uh, where the, the app has been uh, translated uh, at the moment. So, as I said, we have 11 case studies in Minacris, and these case studies are um, active in nine different languages. And thereby, the, the Soil Plastic app is also available in nine languages. And uh, it's running on the, the known Spotteron platform that has a lot of other citizen science applications as well. So if you have uh, user details for one of uh, the apps uh, that Spotteron has made, you can use the same information for all the apps on the, the platform. Uh, on the right hand side, you see that uh, we also have different kind of uh, user roles. So um, uh, we, uh, we have um, uh, different users such as uh, individual, families and school classes. Uh, and uh, this is there so that we can especially made it, make it possible for schools to make a competition, for example, with school classes uh, making the most uh, observations that we are doing in Austria at the moment. Uh, right now we have um, a bit more than 2,000 uh, observations, it's getting close to 2,500. However, we don't really have so many observations from the UK yet. So it would be great uh, to get uh, uh, a couple of uh, more observations from there as well. And what we have uh, learned uh, so far uh, with the app, uh, we, we see that both uh, soil scientists uh, as well as soil citizen scientists uh, can benefit uh, uh, from using this app enables communication between the users. It can be between soil scientists and soil citizen scientists. It can be between individual users of the app. Uh, it also offers an easy way to, to collect data uh, and it can help us to get a better overview of what kind of plastic is out there in the European environment. Uh, and this hopefully will give us more data so that we can see where are some hotspots of uh, plastic uh, disposed plastic in the environment and where we could uh, investigate uh, further. Uh, we hope that uh, by many people using this app uh, we can increase awareness about plastic residues in the environment and plastic use uh, in general. Uh, we also hope to encourage uh, the collection of plastic from the environment. So in the app, you can always click whether you have um, uh, collected the plastic and disposed it. So we don't want people to leave the plastic in the environment, but actually to take it uh, away. Uh, and we also hope that uh, when we have uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, entries, this could also be something that could be used as a background for, for, for policy discussions. Uh, and some recommendations uh, when rolling out an app or when starting to use an app uh, with a bigger group of people. Uh, we've noticed that it's very important uh, with the target specific communication. So, for example, if you're talking with the teachers or aiming to use it with teachers, it's very, very important to train the teachers uh, on the topic and to be uh, available for, for questions. Uh, how to use the app, how to apply with the students. Uh, and we've also noticed that it's very important to check the, the national laws. So whenever you start encouraging people to go out uh, and observe plastic, for example, in the UK, it's very important to, um, to uh, keep the, the countryside code in mind. So not to encourage people to go somewhere they are not supposed to go. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Taro, for that um, incredibly um, interesting talk. I'm pleased to welcome back Sursa Tracy, who's been monitoring the questions you've been sending in um, for the panelists. Just as a reminder, please submit any final questions by 12.50 p.m. That will give us a chance to get through as many as possible. 
So over to you, Sarsa. Hi, so we've got quite a few questions, so I'll try and get through them all. Um, so the, the first question really is for either speaker. Is there any work quantifying a threshold limit by which the abundance of micro microplastics present present in soil starts to become harmful or start, starts to change properties? So could either speaker take that in terms of a threshold limit? You want to do that, Tao, or should I? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, quite a lot of uh, studies like uh, what Matthias is doing uh, are needed in order to uh, determine this kind of uh, thresholds. And there uh, it would, uh, of course, be important then to, uh, to do this on different kind of soils, like Matthias was uh, describing uh, a study uh, looking at different kind of soils in Germany. This was already giving very different results uh, when this would be done for, for European soils, for example, we would have even more response. How fast that uh, work could go? Um, I don't know, Matthias, do you have a, a number of uh, years, how long it could take to get into a threshold? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, there will be no overall threshold. It's not possible because this is such a wide range of different particle types and everything else. Mm -hmm. And this work, you know, those response relationships for this particular um, topic is extremely challenging to carry out in practice, as we have mm -hmm. discovered. We have tried to do this very many times in the lab, and it is not as straightforward as it sounds. Yeah, but it is an important question for sure. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like, yeah, we'll never, well, we might, we're currently not in a position to know when there's a safe level of microplastics, but we have a, a kind of a follow-up question. However, okay. if I if I may answer to that, there is, uh, I mean, there are existing thresholds for, for example, how much plastic then can be in a compost. Uh, there are thresholds for food. So uh, I don't want to say it's impossible. Uh, I would like to say it's possible but uh, there will be a lot of discussion on what the exact level would be. But in other areas, those thresholds already exist. Okay, thank you for that addition, thank you. So as a follow-up question, um, I'll put this to you, Tara. Is there a routine monitoring type of polymer, shape, size, etc.? Is it prohibitively expensive? Um, do the speakers have any suggestions on surrogate measurements as indicators of microplastic concentrations in the soils. So whether a routine uh, measurement is already in place? Yeah, or really is, is there, you mentioned that farmers, they estimate the number of plastic in the fields. What is the, is there a kind of standard operating procedure they have currently besides the app? Yeah. Uh, so I don't think the farmers yet have a standard um, uh, way of um, doing observations on the field. Uh, uh, with the app, uh, we uh, we give a, a guidance of uh, observing all the plastic that you can see, uh, and then you can enter this uh, uh, on the app, and thereby the information comes in a harmonized way. Uh, when it comes to like national uh, monitoring, uh, there are um, a different, uh, for example, in Austria, there is now uh, a project ongoing uh, where samples are taking, uh, being taken across Austria in order to see how much microplastic is in the soils uh, and, and how the methodology can be harmonized. Uh, however, as far as I know, there is not yet uh, a ISO standard that a lot of labs uh, would be following. There, there are several methods, but not one standard, which also makes the, the results, the, the result comparison a little bit more difficult. Okay, thank you. And now a question from Matthias. Do you know what sort of phytotoxic substances are being released by microplastics, adversely affecting plant and microbial function? Yeah, maybe one back to this one. There's also new types of microplastic always discovered in soil. Like we recently documented that there is pigment microplastic, which was the first study of that in soil. And that is not covered by any of the traditional extraction 
methods because those particles have a higher density, so they're excluded in the very first step. So it's far from standard. About the phytotoxic toxic substances, many, very many times it is completely unknown what the things are that come out of the plastics. We did this was this is uh, work done by Shin Ung in uh, collaboration with some other uh, collaborators from South Korea, and basically there is a, a wild bouquet of um, chemicals coming out of these particles, most of which are unknown. You know, I, there's 350,000 registered chemicals that are industrially produced, but that's just basically the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be very many chemicals in that we don't know what they are, and maybe even also the manufacturers will not know what they are. So it is almost um, currently, I would say it's almost impossible to always pinpoint what causes effects. Having said that, in some cases, it's pretty clear, like you know, for tire wear particles, there's so many nasty things in these uh, particles, like also heavy metals that often th those are the culprit. But when it's, um, you know, to pinpoint which of the very many peaks you get from a chemical analysis really causes that is, is really, really challenging. In some cases, it's possible, though. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, Matthias, are there any global effects of soil plastics or is it known? On greenhouse gas emissions is that known well there are um, a number of studies that have been done under more controlled conditions and there are more and more coming out that um, suggest that there is differences in the fluxes of co2 and methane for example in response to these particles having affected the soil there is nothing like a global monitoring program of course and we also still lack the information about the extent of microplastic pollution in a broader uh, scale in order to make that um, statement <laughs> if, if global fluxes have already been affected. But you know, as far as we know from like um, highly controlled laboratory studies, there is the potential for that. Thank you very much. So, uh, Taru, now a question for you. Is there any way to substitute for plastics? Uh, yes, uh, there are. Um biodegradable um, uh, alternatives uh, that can be used in uh, agriculture as well and there the, the idea is then that the material will uh, uh, degrade uh, and this is of course also then depended on how it's uh, handled in the field uh, but there are several companies uh, already producing uh, alternatives like uh, Novamont or um, yeah, that's just uh, one uh, company producing alternatives. Okay, thank you. Uh, now back to Matthias. So we, you've mentioned positive and negative effects on plant growth. Have you observed any positive effect, effects? Or could you go into a bit of detail on what some of those positive effects might look like? Sure. I mean, we often see that uh, root growth is enhanced. Quite a, quite a bit and also shoot growth is enhanced so there's more biomass being produced. We've also now repeatedly in quite a lot of experiments have seen that colonization levels by avascular mycorrhizal fungi which are key root symbionts have also been enhanced quite a lot actually we don't know why. So yeah there's a really a number of parameters that are affected positively. It makes it actually very challenging to communicate right because a positive effect seems like oh that's great but in fact, you know, it's not because that very same substance may have positive effects on some slices of the parameter space, let's say plant performance, but they can negatively affect other parts of the system, let's say soil aggregate stability. And so also that same effect, uh, the positive effect on plant growth, as I had mentioned briefly in the talk, can translate to shifts in plant community composition. And in uh, the few examples where we looked at, it was the species that were rather more undesirable, like that are uh, uh, range expanders, um, not necessarily invasive species yet, but range expanders that were favored. And so I think this is sort of the um, <laughs> the tricky bit to identify these results in the proper context. You know, there's nominally positive effects in a particular target organism, but this is not does not mean that the effects are universally positive on other targets in the in the ecosystem. And also these positive effects propagate to different levels where they are leading to quite more undesirable outcomes. Oh, thank you. That was really interesting. So th this next question, I'll either, either one of you take it if you want, is what are the technological procedures that are being used to remediate microplastics in soil? Is there any? 
I hope you're going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, at least I have not heard of uh, so many uh, remediation uh, actions. I think we still know very little about the amounts of microplastics in soils. So I don't think we have a, a good overall picture of how much is uh, out there. And we also still investigating uh, all the, the sources. So uh, compost is a known example where we know that there is plastic and it's a problem in the agricultural community as well, that sometimes the farmers do not want to have compost because there is so much plastic in it. Um, but um, yeah, I would also be very, excited to, to hear about those uh, remediation actions. I think, you know, my two cents on that is that they are, they are futile. It's a rather pessimistic view, so this is why I didn't want to share it maybe <laughs> as the first, but um, I think it is so high a diversity of um, particles out there. It is not the same as remediating for a specific substance by adding like, let's say a microbe that produces an enzyme that breaks this down even though that doesn't work either uh, in 90% of the cases. <laughs> so that even in the best scenario uh, is hardly ever really successful. And I think that this will be dramatically less successful when you have such a highly diverse contaminant suite because you would have to basically have something for all kinds of polymers and forms and mm -hmm. whatnot. So I think that that, that is <sighs> unlikely to be really successful is what I think, but it's a personal opinion. <laughs> And one follow-up question we have from another attendee is um, to control microplastics contamination in agricultural soils. Do you think that legislating the type of plastic that can be used is the way? So could policy be a solution? Um, policy can definitely be part of the solution. So uh, as uh, the, the first question was also about thresholds, there already are thresholds for, for food, for example. Uh, there are thresholds for, for compost, how much can be there. So um, this may also uh, help to, uh, to minimize the amount of plastic that is going there. But I think we probably need, yeah, a number of uh, we need uh, uh, a bouquet of uh, stakeholders to go together to solve the issue okay thank you we've got a lot of questions i don't think we're going to be able to answer them all and there was quite a few questions taru on the app just i'll, I'll just ask a couple but maybe we'll follow up manually afterwards is uh, does the soil plastic app accept data from outside of europe yes it does it is um uh, we have uh, translated it to these uh, nine languages for the reason that these are the, the case study languages in Minacris and we want every case study to be able to use it. Uh, but um, observations uh, anywhere in the world uh, can be entered into the map. So you just, uh, yeah, wherever you are with your mobile, uh, you can put an entry. Um. Sorry, just trying to locate the other um, app questions. No, um, I think we've answered those. Oh, so one of the questions, uh, Larry, was um, will you incorporate the shape of microplastic um, in the soil analysis as an important driver? So the shape of the microplastic. Yep. Was this for Matthias? Or? Um, I think it was in relation to the app. Can it take in relation to the app? Yes. So we have um, uh, on the app, uh, you will be asked what kind of plastic it is. Uh, and by that, uh, we will also get an indication of uh, what is the, the shape of the, the plastic. So is it a foil? Is it a wrapping? Uh, is it a box? Uh, is it a plastic fleece, irrigation pipe? Uh, we uh, will then indirectly get information on the, the shape. We did quite a, a big discussion round in the task uh, back and forth. Uh, what is the inf what's the amount of information that we want from the app and what's the information that we can ask from the, the user? And this was our compromise to, to get the kind of the type of the plastic and then we can 
have an assumption of the shape. Okay, um, thank you for answering so many questions but to both the speakers. I'm going to hand back over to Paul now as chair. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sarsa. This was an absolutely great zoom into soil. So I want to, first of all, on behalf of the British Society of Soil Science, thank the two speakers, um, Professor Matthias Rillig and Dr. Taru um, Sandian, for coming along to present today and showing their really impressive research and also ideas and applications of the research as well. And I also saw the questions that Sursa was working through. So thank you to her for uh, dealing with all those. It was monumental, the task that she performed. Um, thank you also to the Soil Science Society of Ireland for supporting this webinar. And thank you to all 180 of you for attending the webinar as well. Um, you'll find a quick feedback survey when you leave the webinar, which we hope you'll be able to complete. The recording of this video will also be available after the event on the British Society of Soil Science YouTube channel. And as Sursa mentioned at the start, we're holding the annual conference with the Soil Science Society of Ireland from Monday the 4th to Tuesday the 5th of December in Belfast. And it's set to be a great event. And um, registration is gonna be open on the website very shortly. The next webinar will be held on Wednesday the 3rd of May. Registration hasn't opened yet, so keep an eye out on our website and social media for any further updates. And I hope to see you at future events. And in the meantime, thank you again and goodbye.